Hi everyone. Uh, okay, good. Okay, so as the uh, the title of my my paper implies, today what I'm going to talk about is um, what what we talk about when we talk about our very earliest video game memories. And this paper is based on a, a chapter of a book that I'm currently working on, which is on um, video games and psychoanalysis. So in brief, what I'm going to do in this paper is analyze video game memories as texts. So rather than like analyzing video game memories as, as data that can help shed light on what actually happened in video game history, what I'm going to do is analyze video game memories as, as text, as text to be interpreted. And a key influence here for me is um, work on cultural memory in cinema studies, such as this book by Annette Kuhn. I should also mention that I'm also extremely influenced by work on memory in, in game studies uh, by, for example, Helen, who's chairing this session, and Yako, who's here as well. But um, yeah, in particular, I'm focusing here on Annette Kuhn. So what Kuhn does in this book is she interviews people about their, their earliest cinema going memories. And her interest in doing this is not so much in cataloging like what people remember about going to the cinema when they were children, but rather how they remember their earliest cinema going experiences. So in other words, like what form do their memories take? Um, what words do they use to describe their memories? How do they actually perform their memories in the act of recollecting them? And so on. So this is her focus and this is also where I'm coming from. And this is my archive. So this is a, a podcast um, called Checkpoints, which ran from 2015 to 2018. Um, the show's creator and host, Declan Deneen, actually gave me permission to use material from this show um, in this research. Obviously, there are a load of video game podcasts, but I selected um, this one for my study because of its focus on video game memory, in that um, this is a podcast where uh, in each episode of the show, and there are over 120 of them, um, Deneen, the, the host, what he does is he interviews a different person and he talks about their video game memories. And every interview begins with the same question, which is if you can remember what was your first experience of a video game. And this question also frames the podcast's um, underlying premise. And that premise is that like an interviewee's life narrative can be traced back to their formative video game experiences. This isn't the argument that I'm making in this paper, but this is the premise of the podcast. Obviously, um, because this is a podcast, um, interviewees are recorded with the knowledge that they'll be listened to by, by others. And this, I, I claim, is precisely why the podcast is useful for analyzing video game memories as texts, for, in other words, analyzing the performative nature of video game memory. It is worth acknowledging, though, that um, as, as we would all know, any public archive places limits on what you can and can't say about history and memory and checkpoints is, is no exception. It's actually quite, quite a limited archive in some respects in that, for example, most of the show's interviewees grew up in the United Kingdom or the US. Uh, the vast majority are cis male. The dominant age range is 30 to 39. Most of the people he interviews work in the video game industry. Most possess a meaningful relationship to video games through work and or leisure. So there aren't any people who, you know, only played video games when they were children and then subsequently moved away from them. So it is a limited archive in some respects. There's no getting around the fact that these are very clear limitations. And what this means is that for the most part, the memories that are contained in this podcast are oriented largely towards normative understandings of, for example, the life narrative, or even memories of the, the family home. These have very heteronormative underpinnings, these memories. Um, but even with these limitations in mind, I still think the podcast is, is really useful as an archive in that I think it's useful for identifying common themes in what I'm going to call the dominant construction of video game memory. So it's, it's useful for analyzing how, I guess, in the dominant culture, we tend to uh, narrativize, thematize video game memory and, and nostalgia. I should also note that um, although most of the people Deneen interviews are household names in video game culture, and he actually interviews quite a few academics, game studies academics, who we would all know, um, many are simply his friends. So it is in, in some sense, um, that is probably the one diverse element of it. Okay, so in the chapter version of this paper, I identify five memory themes in this um, archive. And originally my plan was to discuss all five, but of course that's far too ambitious. So I've cut it down to two for today. 
So my overall argument here is that um, I'm going to get into these first two themes in a second, but my overall argument is that although that the content of video game memory differs from person to person in that we all have different memories, of course, what I want to claim is that there are nonetheless common patterns in how, again, how rather than what, people remember about their earliest video game experiences, how they remember. Um, I mentioned before that this research is coming from a book on video games and psychoanalysis. I'm not going to be psychoanalyzing people. Um, that would obviously be deeply inappropriate. What I'm doing is using psychoanalytic theory to explain why there are these common structures in the first instance. We can debate the merits of psychoanalysis all day, but I'm not going to do that in this paper. Um, so let's begin with the, um, the first theme, which is uh, what I'm calling the fantasy of the first video game encounter. So clearly the first encounter is an important theme in the show itself, given that all interviews start with that question, what was your first experience of a video game? And someone who gave me feedback on this paper commented that, you know, isn't this podcast just further um, evidence of uh, video game history's preoccupation and obsession with what came first? And in many ways, yes, it absolutely is. Um, but the point I want to make here is that the first experience in video game memory is defined not by its presence, but rather by its absence. So this is a really crucial point. So it's a missing memory for the most part. Um, it's a retroactive fantasy in that most interviewees, I mean, some can, but most, I would say, simply cannot remember their first video game experience. But it's an absence in memory that nonetheless gives shape, I want to argue, to the phantasmatic structure of video game memory. So one of my arguments here is that what, what can't be rem remembered in video game memory is in fact just as important as what can be remembered. So most interviewees can't recall the first video game they actually played. So what they tend to do instead is describe the general feelings, the affective responses they attribute um, retroactively to the first video game experience. So the first encounter is often associated with this mind-blowing, magical, intoxicating moment, or a moment of what I'm calling affective revealing, video games revealing themselves both in the memory and in the act of recollection. And for most, the first encounter is also mediated through the presence of others. So parents, siblings, uh, people describe experiences of hearing about video games, reading about them, fantasizing about them before they experience them themselves, and so on and so forth. One interviewee, for example, recalls being at a social club and seeing a, a Space Invaders arcade cabinet for the first time. So he says there was this big, tall cabinet thing and everyone was gathered around it, making you know, a huge fuss. And he, and um, interestingly, a few other interviewees, this isn't a common pattern, but it's interesting that this happens. He and a few other interviewees compare Space Invaders to the monolith in 2001, just you know, this monumental arrival. Um, and then in his memory, it's kind of revealed to him as, as a video game in this kind of performative way um, through the help of his father. So he remembers his father lifting him up so he can see the screen. And this, he claims, was definitely the first time he ever saw a video game. This is one of the few people who is quite confident in making that assertion. And this moment of affective revealing is described in similar ways by interviewees who grew up even in the 80s and 90s. So it's not just something that people um, who grew up when video games were a relatively new thing, uh, describe experiencing. Um, another interviewee describes memories of seeing her father like frequently disappear behind the family TV set in order to make repairs. And then one day her father goes back there and connects an Atari 2600, which she doesn't realize he's doing. So she just conflates what he's doing with his usual repair work. She says, my dad went back there, he did some stuff with tools and all of a sudden I could control things on the TV. This was magic to me. So the important point here is not whether these memories of magical moments accurately capture what happened when video games were first experienced, but rather how they give shape to the phantasmatic structure of video game memory. And here I think there's a productive comparison to be made between early video game memories and very early cinema mem memories in that, you know, we know that the foundational myth of cinema is arguably that of um, audiences fleeing in terror from the um, Lumiere brothers' film screenings. Film historians have obviously questioned the historical accuracy of this myth. It probably didn't happen in the way that it is often remembered as happening. But the important point about these myths is not whether they tell the truth. What's important is, again, how they give shape to the way we remember. And I'm, I'm arguing here that something similar is happening with video games. 
So the fantasy of the first video game encounter sets in motion what one interviewee describes as a constant quest of trying to get my hands on a video game system whenever I could. So there is, in other words, um, a common desire in this checkpoints uh, archive across the memories, a common desire to recuperate the lost enjoyment. So I'm calling it the lost enjoyment attributed to the first video game encounter. So this lost enjoyment is unobtainable because the first encounter is, as I've established, defined by its absence, not by its presence. But by investing in this fantasy, by investing in the fantasy that that's, this lost enjoyment can be recuperated performatively, um, the first encounter becomes kind of reified in the Checkpoints podcast. And in this way, here comes the psychoanalytic theory. The fantasy of the first video game encounter um, is, I argue, an example of what the French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan would call objet R. So the objet R, in brief, is an object of lost enjoyment that the subject can never retrieve because it's not, for Lacan, an empirical object. It never existed in the first instance. It is an object that is sacrificed into existence um, as a result of the subject's inauguration as a speaking being. But it's nonetheless an object that causes the subject's repetitive drive to satisfy their desire. So the first video game encounter, I'm claiming, gains its phantasmatic status in video game memory, its status as the object R of video game memory, because it retroactively <laughs> narrates a scenario wherein enjoyment was in the player's possession, but then subsequently lost. So they're going to try to constantly retrieve it, but they can't. They can't even remember it. But it's by virtue of this absence, this absence of this magical moment of affective revealing that, yeah, again, gives shape to video game memory, that phantasmatic structure. Okay, so related to the first encounter, another common theme in early video game memory is the presence of what Lacan, again, would call big others. Um, big others, uh, or the big other is just another word for figures of social authority who don't technically exist. Um, so it, early video game memories are often anchored or mediated, I'm sorry, anchored to or mediated through the presence of these, these sorts of figures. And these figures are usually, but not always, paternal and or maternal figures. So often in video game memory, mothers and fathers, paternal and maternal figures, play similar roles. Um, so they often enable and or prohibit access to video games. Uh, they indi are indifferent toward the interviewee's love of video games. They connect with the interviewee through video games. Um, and importantly, they often seem to possess some sort of privileged access to this lost enjoyment that the interviewee attributes to their first video game experience. So there are commonalities, but there are also differences in how paternal and maternal figures are represented in, the, in video game memory, and, and these differences are very gendered. So paternal figures are often remembered for being early adopters, for bringing video games home from work, um, one interviewee comments that their childhood game collection was basically games that their dad wanted. He had money, I didn't, so I played whatever he bought. So this trope in the archive um, of fathers providing video games to the, to the child feeds into this broader mythology of, of father figures providing access to tools and technologies, usually to their sons, um, through a patriarchal lineage. Like paternal figures, maternal figures also provide access to video games by, for example, bringing them home from work. But the maternal act of making technology available tends not to be framed through the lens of paternal bonding or um, patriarchal lineage, but rather through these metaphors of nurturance, um, sacrifice, excessive acts of generosity, and so on. You know, I can't imagine the hardships my mother suffered, um, et cetera, et cetera. Importantly though, so mothers and fathers aren't the only authoritative figures to appear in early video game memories. You often have these other like larger than life figures appearing. So one interviewee, just as an, a, an example, recalls witnessing at a young age, an arcade operator replacing a cabinet in, in the local arcade. And this arcade operator takes on a similar status as um, a big other in his memory. So he says like, you know, what are you doing? Um, to, you know, he's trying to perform and recollect the memory um, at once. And then the arcade operator responds by saying, well, I'm just changing the boards, taking the money. It was his operation. He would drive around the valleys um, with his van. He would carry arcade machines on his back, apparently. So, you know, these larger than life figures because he was an actual Welsh monolith with hands like shovels, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So these figures often take on a revered status um, in interviewees' recollections. 
And the reason for this, um, I think, uh, might be that from, from the child's point of view, these figures like appear to be like unrestricted by the usual barriers that prohibit access to video games. So parents, money, mobility, and so on. So interviewees often describe really frustrated memories of just not being able to play video games. Like after that first experience, it's frustration. I can't play enough video games. I don't have enough money for them, et cetera, et cetera. Yet these big others seem to possess privileged access to that lost enjoyment. And it's through these big others that people remember kind of, um, I guess, structuring their own desire for video games, if I can use a very psychoanalytic um, conception there. Okay, so now I'm just gonna um, summarize what I've talked about. And I stress here that this is a, a work in progress at the moment and just a brief snapshot of, you know, 120 plus interviews, which I uh, coded, um, which took a long time. So the first point I've made today is that video game memories aren't simply mental records of what, what happened in the past. Um, they're also texts to be interpreted, particularly when they're performed in, in public contexts, such as the, um, the checkpoints interview recordings. So I guess the most complicated point, oh, actually, sorry, before I get onto that, what another point, maybe an interesting one, is that what can't be remembered is just as important as what can be remembered. Um, the most complicated point perhaps I've made is that the Checkpoints podcast is premised on this retroactive fantasy of the first video game encounter. So that first encounter tends to be associated with this moment of profound discovery, a moment of affective revealing, as I put it. Um, and, th and in this way, that first encounter takes on the status of an objet R in video game memory, an object of lost, irretrievable enjoyment, um, that although it's lost, ultimately gives shape to the phantasmatic structure of video game memory. Typically, early video game memories are anchored not to particular video games, um, but often to big others, authoritative figures. Um, and uh, actually, just to, I guess, actually, I, I'm almost out of time. So um, I guess the final point is that video game memories should not simply be treated as data for historical research, research but also as um, discourse, as material for interpretation, to quote Kuhn. And I'll finish up there. Thanks, everyone.